and welcome to NASA's Lunar Science Media Briefing for the agency's Commercial Lunar Payload Services, or CLIPS, initiative. I'm Nila Ferranji from NASA's Office of Communications. Today's briefing will preview the NASA payloads flying aboard one of the first CLIPS flights, Intuitive Machines' IM-1 mission. This flight is scheduled to launch aboard SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket no earlier than Wednesday, February 14, 2024. This briefing will highlight the NASA science investigations and technology demonstrations flying aboard Intuitive Machines' Nova Sea lander named Odysseus. Our briefers today are Susan Letterer, CLIPS Project Scientist at NASA Johnson, Farzan Amzajadarian, Principal Investigator, Investigator for the Navigation Doppler LiDAR at NASA Langley, Tamara Statham, Co-Principal Investigator, Investigator for Lunar Node 1 at NASA Marshall, Daniel Kremens, Deputy Principal Investigator for the Laser Retroreflector Array at NASA Goddard. Nat Gopalswamy, Principal Investigator for the Radio Observations of the Lunar Surface Photoelectron Sheath at NASA Goddard. Michelle Monk, Principal Investigator for the Stereo Camera for Lunar Plume Surface Studies at NASA Langley. And Lauren Amin, Deputy Project Manager for the Cryogenic Fluid Management on behalf of the Radio Fre Frequency Mass Gauge at NASA Glenn. First, we'll start with some initial remarks from each of our briefers before opening it up for questions. We'll be taking questions online, so if you've joined us here today, please press star 1 to submit a question and to ask your question. You will be unmuted to ask your question, and once your name is called, please state your name, affiliation, and to whom you'd like to direct your question. We are also taking questions today from our digital platforms. The public can submit their questions on social media using the hashtag AskNASA. We'll now begin with opening remarks from Sue Letterer. Sue, over to you. Good morning, everyone. I'm the CLIPS Project Scientist for IM1, so I'm working with all the NASA payload teams and Dr. Deborah Needham, our Headquarters Program Scientist, to ensure that operations maximize the science and technology return from our payloads. First, I want to give you a little overview of what CLIPS is all about. The goal here is for us to investigate the moon in preparation for Artemis and really to do business differently for NASA. One of our main goals is to make sure that we develop a lunar economy for CLIPS we, NASA, hitch a ride on a lunar lander that's developed by commercial industry. These aren't NASA missions, they're commercial missions. These commercial companies will be bringing our instruments along for the ride, enabling our investigations by providing power, data, and calm to us. With the commercial industry comes a competitive environment, which means that our investment up front ultimately gets far more for far less. So instead of one mission in a decade, it allows for more like 10 commercial missions to the moon in a decade. Instead of four or five instruments in that one decade, it's more like four to five dozen instruments. Being risk, risk tolerant allows for high yield and high reward, and this is the beauty of CLIPS. We'll learn from what does and doesn't work, testing many technologies, conducting experiments at a lower cost, and significantly faster than traditional NASA missions. This will allow us to prepare for Artemis more, efficiency, but more efficiently. When you change the frequency of missions and the risk posture, you change how you do things. Opportunities arise for far more science and technology investigations, a far greater number of places you can go to on the moon, and the diversity of people involved blooms to in inspire all future explorers. This is CLIPS. The first commercial mission for intuitive machines will hold a suite of six NASA payloads. The landing site that we're going to is a relatively safe and flat area, a little ways from the Malapert A crater, about 10 degrees from the South Pole. The South Pole is generally a fairly rough area. This will give our commercial vendor, Intuitive Machines, an opportunity to bring this suite of payloads to an area that'll be the farthest south that any private lander has ever been to on the moon and it will give us an opportunity to test our instruments in this very harsh environment where the sun is always low on the horizon. The temperature gets quite cold and will help us teach what challenges face us in communicating with the Earth when it's also rather low on the horizon. Our LN1 payload is going to help us learn about communicating from areas around the South Pole like this. The NASA payloads on IM1 will also test technologies that'll pave for the way for how to navigate to and land safely and autonomously on the lunar surface, including NDL, 
that uses lasers to guide how fast and how close the lander is during landing. LRA that reflects laser light right back to the incoming or orbiting spacecraft with the laser to give future spacecraft a reference point on the lunar surface. LN1 will test technologies that will act like a lighthouse, but as a radio beacon, similar to how you use your GPS. RFMG will measure propellants and fuel left in the tanks to allow for a safe landing, ensuring that we have enough fuel when we land. Scalps will image the engine exhaust churning up dust on the surface. This will expose fresh surface underneath, and the suite of cameras will then continue to image that surface for science investigation. And finally, Roses will investigate influences of the sun on the lunar surface, both for science and to help better prepare for Artemis missions, and to conduct radio astronomy for the first time from the moon. All very exciting. Mildefer, back to you. Thank you so much, Sue. We'll now hand it over to our CLIPS payload teams. Let's begin with Farzan Amzajuharian for the Navigation Doppler LiDAR. Farzan? Good morning. Uh, navigation Doppler LiDAR is a laser sensor that shoots three laser beams to the ground and measures a spacecraft velocity. That's, that's the speed and the direction of the flight. And the altitude above the ground this is when the vehicle begins its descent toward the landing site. So it comes on during the last few minutes of the mission. This is the critical phase that every event, every maneuver, every thruster firing has to be perfectly on the queue. This is those minutes of terror. By providing very precise velocity and altitude data, the NDL enables the spacecraft to navigate exactly to the landing site and help it touch down gently at the intended location. So the NDL will play an important role in the future landing missions as we are moving toward landing in rough terrain and putting the landers at precise locations, perhaps at the edge of a cliff or close to pre-deployed assets. Uh, this IM-1 mission will be a great demonstration of this technology for those future missions, including human missions to the moon. Thank you. Thank you, Farzan. Next up, we have Tamara Statham for Lunar Node 1. Tamara? Yes, good morning. I'm Tamara Statham with NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, and I'm the co-investigator for the Lunar Node 1 payload. Lunar Node 1, or LN1, is a navigation beacon demonstration. Its goal will be to demo autonomous navigation technologies that are desperately needed to support a growing lunar architecture. As lunar activity increases around the moon, so too will demand increase on Earth-based systems like the Deep Space Network for navigation needs. While these systems provide great capability, the capacity will be outpaced by the number of users. LN1 takes advantage of CubeSat flight hardware. It's a small platform easily integrated into future elements of lunar infrastructure. LN1 utilizes the Multi-Spacecraft Autonomous Positioning System, or MAPS. With MAPS, every lunar element serves as a node in a greater network, and nodes share packets that embed their time and state in a standardized format. With reception of a packet, a node is able to form range and range rate observations from a source that is broadcasting out its local position. In this approach, each asset can become a navigation reference. LN1 will also demo a one-way ranging signal similar to that used within GPS satellites. This enables an alternate approach to determine distances between assets and, when combined with map transmission of position and time, allows it to operate in a similar manner to a GPS satellite. LN1 demonstrates one node of a greater network, and then throughout transit and on the surface of the moon, the payload will broadcast telemetry packets to Earth where the signal will be received by the Deep Space Network, processed, and a NAV solution compared against others like that of the IM lander. Future upgraded versions of LN1 will demo two-way ranging, survive the night capability, as well as integration capability with the LunarNet COM and NAV infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamara. Next up, we have Daniel Cremens for the Laser Retroreflector Array. Daniel? 
Good morning, everyone. I'm Daniel Kremens from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and I'm the Deputy Principal Investigator for the Laser Retro Reflector Array Instrument, or LRA. Um, as you may know, LRA is a completely passive instrument consisting of a hemispherical array of special glass prisms called retroreflectors. What they do is they return the light back directly towards the illumination source. A similar optical phenomenon is used in road markers to make them shine brightly under a car's headlights. On a clips lander, however, LRA will act as a precise marker of the lander position, and that will be visible under illumination from either a laser ranging system on board an orbiting or landing spacecraft. Now, LRA requires no power, no thermal control, or interaction with the lander, which allows it to be used for decades on the lunar surface and in the challenging lunar condition, thermal conditions at the South Pole. LRA will be used to geolocate the lander on the surface with high precision, measure any changes in the lander position over long time periods, and determine the precise orbit or landing trajectory of a spacecraft illuminating it. The LRA, the LRA team is very excited to be a part of the Intuitive Machines mission. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Over to you, Nat, Nat Gopalswamy, for the radio observations of the lunar surface photoelectron sheath. Nat? Hello, everyone. Rolls-Royce is a radio telescope operating in the frequency range from 3 kilohertz to 30 megahertz to observe cosmic and terrestrial radio waves on the moon. The low-frequency cosmic radio waves cannot be detected on Earth due to the intervening ionosphere. Rolls-Royce will detect the powerful auroral kilometric radiation originating at several thousand miles above Earth's poles. Various transmitters on Earth broadcast wide-ranging radio waves that are also appearing as noise on the moon, adding to any noise generated by the mechanisms on the lander. The sun emits different types of radio bursts that will be detected by roses. These bursts are caused by energetic electrons interacting with solar magnetic fields. They inform us about the physical conditions in the corona and interplanetary medium, and also about solar flares and coronal mass ejections. Roses will detect intense radio emissions from Jupiter. Such emissions are also known from Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. The knowledge on planetary radio emission will be helpful in detecting exoplanets using radio telescopes in the future. Rolls-Royce will measure the electron density and vertical gradient above the lunar surface. These are photoelectrons knocked off from the solar surface by sunlight. The impact of lunar dust on Rolls-Royce antennas is expected to produce detectable radio signal. These dust impacts are known to peak at the terminator and are responsible for the so-called horizon glow. Finally, the radio intensity of the Milky Way galaxy peaks in the Rolls-Royce frequency range. Detecting and characterizing the galactic background emission is important for cosmological studies. The Rolls-Royce instrument on IM-1 is thus poised to contribute to answering wide-ranging science questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nat. Next up is Michelle Monk for the Stereo Camera for Lunar Plume Surface Studies. Michelle, over to you. Hi, welcome everybody. I'm Michelle Monk from the NASA Langley Research Center, and I'm the Principal Investigator for the Stereo Cameras for Lunar Plume Surface Studies, or SCALPS. SCALPS is comprised of four small cameras mounted near the bottom of the Odysseus lander and oriented so that they can view the surface under the main engine. The cameras will take images during vertical descent towards the moon through touchdown and then engine shutdown. They'll continue to take images periodically throughout the lunar day until the mission ends. Using a stereo photogrammetry technique, our team will then reconstruct a three-dimensional shape of the lunar surface to see the extent of erosion that occurred during landing. The scalps measurement is going to provide us a critical data set to anchor computer models for predicting plume surface interaction effects. These effects will be really important to understand as we start to send larger landers to the moon and with humans and to aggregate assets close together to support a sustained lunar presence in Artemis. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And finally, over to Lauren Amin for the radio frequency mass gauge. Lauren? Hi, good morning. I'm Lauren Amin. I'm the deputy manager of the Cryogenic Fluid Management Portfolio Office at the NASA Glenn Research Center. 
and I'm here today on behalf of the Radio Frequency Mass Gauge Team, or RFMG. RFMG is one of the cryogenic fluid management technologies in development within our portfolio office. The RFMG and IM1 will demonstrate a sensor technology that's been in development at NASA Glenn for over the last 15 years. RFMG allows for more accurate in-space cryogenic fuel gauging in spacecraft fuel tanks like those in the IM1 Nova Sea lander. Our, our engineers do this by measuring the electromagnetic spectrum, or radio waves, within the tanks throughout the mission, compare them to a vast fluid simulation database our team has been building, accurately gauge how much propellant is inside those tanks. Our FMG has been, has been proven in gr many ground tests, a suborbital parabolic flight, and also on an experiment on the International Space Station. Our FMG's demo on IM-1 will provide NASA for the very first time long-duration microgravity data that will be used to iterate and scale the technology to enable improved spacecraft and lander operations. This RFMG technology is critical and enabling for future long-duration missions that use cryogenic propellants, as our RFMG could potentially save fuel and take the guesswork out of space, spacecraft design and operations in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren, and thanks to our briefers for those initial remarks. For awareness, we also have some additional NASA subject matter experts on the line in case there are specific questions that come up. We'll now open it up for questions. Again, for those of you on the line today, please press star 1 to submit a question. And once your name is called, please state your name, affiliation, and to whom you'd like to direct your question. If you find that your question has already been answered, press star 2, with star two to withdraw it. Our first question is from Jonathan at Fox News. Jonathan, your line is now open. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Sari with Fox News. Thanks so much for doing this briefing. Uh, my question is for any of the NASA experts who'd like to jump in. As you look ahead to crewed landings on the moon with the Artemis program, what would you say is the most important thing or the biggest unknown that you're hoping to learn about the South Polar region through the IM-1 mission? Thank you. Sue, I'll ask you to kick that off. Sorry. Sure thing. This is Sue, uh, the project scientist for the IM-1, uh, all the, the payloads. So for the South Pole, it's a really, really harsh environment. And what we have planned for IM-1 really kind of concentrates on this safe landing and making sure that we can also communicate back to the Earth. Uh, sometimes when you're at a very, very low point on the horizon, the communications can kind of bounce along the terrain coming and going. So having a location that's close to the South Pole will help us to start investigating those kinds of things that are happening. LN1 will help us with those investigations. Um, and also, because the environment is quite harsh, it's going to give us a baseline for understanding things like how do solar panels work and how do the instruments function in these very cold temperatures or warm temperatures when the sun is shining on them. So it, I think it's a very good place to start having some uh, slightly more straightforward payloads that investigate how the South Pole uh, Acts, what the environment is like to help us with future missions. Perfect, thank you. Our next question comes from Will Robinson Smith from Space Flight Now. Will, your line is now open. Yes, hi, Will Robinson Smith from Space Flight Now. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer our questions. Um, one to Lauren Amin, if I could. Um, in the data that you'll be getting back from the radio frequency mass gauge is the intent to, you know, not just for, you know, future CLIPS missions, but for the uh, human landing system program, lander, uh, contractor, SpaceX, and Blue Origin principally, uh, is, the, is the goal to share that data with them to help better inform some of their uh, cryogenic propellant transfer, both demonstrations as well as the actual uh, performance uh, thereof during the Artemis missions that they're a part of. Thanks. Hey, yeah, this is Lauren. Um, yeah, so the opportunity to, to um, understand and demonstrate RFMG during the tr most of the transit phase of the Odysseus lander is going to give us an opportunity to understand how the data correlates with what I talked about, that vast fluid simulation database, which is really how we uh, estimate 
um, how, how much propellant is in the tank. Like all the other uh, space technology um, projects at, at NASA, we absolutely intend on improving our, our data and, and sharing that with all of our commercial partners, not just those for HLS. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, but absolutely, I think the intent is to infuse this RFMG technology into all future missions um, where, where that makes sense um, to, to really try to improve our cryogenic fluid management capability. Thanks, Lauren, and thanks for that question. Uh, we're now going to hear some questions we receive from our social media platforms using the hashtag AskNASA. And our first question comes from Instagram, and it was, what type of fuel is the lunar lander using? Uh, Sue, I'm going to punt that question over to you to respond to. So we're going to be using uh, both liquid oxygen um, and liquid methane. These are both cryogenic fuels. And I'm actually going to pass that right back over to Lauren because their team is working very closely with intuitive machines on their liquid propellants. Hey, Sue. Yep, you're correct. Liquid oxygen, liquid methane. And I'll just say, too, that um, our RFMG team has been working with the IM1 team um, over the last week during their wet dress rehearsals, and um, those have gone really well. And um, so our, we've, we've proven out that our RFMG payload is, is, is working. Perfect. Thank you both. Um, our next question um, from using the hashtag AskNASA comes from Facebook, and that is how much space or mass does the lander or the payloads take up? So for this uh, purpose, since we are uh, looking at the NASA-provided lunar payloads, let's talk about how much mass the NASA payloads take up on IM's Nova Sea lander. And I will give that one to Sue, sorry. Yeah, so I think we actually have uh, Chris Colbert in the room, and he might actually know the answer to that question off the top of his head. I do not. Sure. So it's in the range of 40 kilograms. Um, for the first two missions that CLIPS sponsored, we were uh, a little on the lighter side. You'll, you'll probably note that our later missions are closer to 100 kilograms. But for IM's first mission here, it's close to 40 kilograms of NASA payloads. Thank you both. Now we'll go back to uh, a couple of questions from the media. Next up, we have Bill Harwood from CBS News. Bill, your line is now open. Hey, thank you very much. Um, I have two quick questions. Uh, one from Michelle. Is, is, is the payload primarily just to demonstrate the technology and show how it works, or do you expect to actually learn something about the, the soil in that region? In other words, is there, are you, what are you expecting from that soil at the landing site? Um, and the second question, I think, is for... Uh, Susan, uh, not, no, I'm sorry, not for Susan. Let me get my name straight here. I'm sorry. For Lauren, um, can you give us a little more info on how the, the testing worked? I mean, I don't know when they fuel your spacecraft uh, during the countdown um, or how any of that works. Is, is We don't really have many details about that. Thanks. Okay, this is Michelle. I'll take the first part of that. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, this is actually both a, a technology demonstration and um, hopefully uh, some use for science. I guess I'd call it more of an um, engineering uh, measurement, um, but we are really excited about the opportunity to uh, go towards the South Pole because that is an area, as uh, Sue mentioned, that we haven't landed in before. So we have the uh, video from the Apollo landings um, in the Mare region where you see, you know, lots of uh, dust blown around, thrown out from the base of the Apollo landers. And uh, we really want to see uh, if the behavior is similar at the South Pole. Um, now, granted, this uh, Odysseus lander is a, a much different scale than Apollo or from the landers that we intend to send in the future. Um, but this starts us on the path of both um, demonstrating that this uh, instrument can make a measurement and uh, getting some early knowledge about the South Pole regolith and how it will behave. So I uh, hope that answers it. Thank you. And if I can just step in real quick, this is Sue, and 
uh, one of the things that we at NASA do is when we have instruments that are designed to gather data that can be used for science, we have something called the planetary data system, which is online where the images and the data, such as what Scouts is going to be collecting, is actually archived for future use for scientists to continue to use that data to understand better what the surface of the moon is like in this case. And this will be archived with the PDS. And I can tell you that at least from my past as an astronomer, using images to study different uh, types of astronomical bodies, the images themselves can be used to really dig in when you see the, the very close in features. And so I expect that we're going to get some really good science out of the imagery that's coming back from scalps, without a doubt. All right, and this is Chris Culbert. I'll, I'll, I'll hit your second question about the, the ground ops for the LOX methane. So this is the first time we've flown LOX methane off of uh, one of the old shuttle pads, 39A. So it did require some modification to the shuttle pads to allow the... SpaceX to fuel the lander while it's on the pad. And because these are cryogenic fuels that will boil off if they get too warm, you, f you put that fuel in pretty late. So right now, we expect they will start fueling both the, uh, the tanks on the lander about three hours before liftoff. And it takes a couple of hours to fill the tanks up. You want to make sure that they maintain the right temperatures all the way through that load process, and you have to get the right temperature before you can launch. But they've run a couple of wet dress rehearsals uh, over the last week to demonstrate all that systems that have all worked very well. So we're looking forward to a, a very successful launch this week. Thank you all. Our next question comes from Gina Sinceri at ABC News. Gina, your line is now open. Thank you. This question is for Farzeen. I'm interested in the LIDAR experiment. Uh, how important are lasers becoming in this kind of exploration? Okay, uh, yes, this is Farzin uh, from NASA Langley. Uh, th that's a tough question. Um, so uh, as we are looking into these more challenging, more ambitious landing missions, uh, LIDAR and laser is going to be playing much uh, important role as we're going forward. The navigation doctor LIDAR that provides the velocity and altitude, the, it's uh, sort of can think of it of a replacement of the radar sensors that were used before. But the precision of this laser this sensor is at least an order of magnitude greater. So the, the quality of data, the precision, will, will really help this landing vehicle to navigate more precisely toward the landing site. Um, so this is just one aspect. We are also looking at LIDAR for uh, doing hazard detection on the landing. That is, once we are uh, reached the landing location and we are starting to do a, a vertical descent, we want to be able to map the terrain and figure where the hazards are and uh, make sure that the lander does not um, uh, land on the piece of rock or a, or, a, or a crater hole. And uh, and that's another area that uh, the laser and LIDAR can play a critical role. Yet there is another application for the lasers that are being looked at, and that is uh, train relative navigation. That is when we are way up, maybe 20, 30 kilometers above the ground using the laser to look at the features trained be below and look for known features like a known crater to give us a good position information. Um, I'm sorry for, uh, you know, touching all these technologies, but let me, let me summarize them. So when we are coming down, uh, let's say we're going to the moon and we are starting at 30, 20 kilometers above the ground and we are kind of horizontally or uh, at a slanted path, going down, the laser can look at the train below uh, to find known features so we know where we are. Then we have the navigation Doppler LiDAR that's going to be demonstrated on this mission to provide very precise velocity and altitude data 
for the vehicle to navigate precisely to the landing site. And once we get there, a uh, laser can scan the ground below and um, uh, do the, so we can avoid the hazards and land the uh, vehicle between, you know, rocks and craters precisely. I, I hope that answers your question. That was great, Farzan. Thank you both. Uh, thank you so much. We're going to switch gears for a moment and go back to questions uh, on social media using the hashtag AskNASA. From Instagram, how will the lander or the payloads recharge? And can the lander rotate to face the sun? I'm actually going to ask Chris Colbert, Program Manager for CLIP, to answer that question. Chris? Sure. So, um, uh, yeah, recharging is done through solar arrays. So the lander will have solar arrays on it that will capture energy from the sun, turn it into electricity, and pass it on to the payloads. During transit to the moon, yes, the lander will rotate or, or adjust its attitude so that the solar arrays get the right amount of sun, sun on them so it can generate power. Once it lands on the moon, no, it's it landed and it doesn't move anymore. The solar arrays are not on gimbals or mechanisms that let them change their direction. So intuitive machines have spent a fair amount of energy analyzing where they're landing, where the sun's going to be, and how the sun will cross the horizon during the portion of lunar day that they're there. And then they, 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 they design the lander arrays canted such that they capture the right amount of sunlight to generate electricity. Thank you, Chris. Our next question from uh, from social media uh, is about uh, lunar dust. So is moon dust analysis planned? And I think I'm going to turn that over to the scallops team that's on the line. Um, I'm, this is Michelle. I'm not quite sure uh, about moon dust um, investigation. Um, back to the answer that Sue provided, um, I think, you know, close-up imagery of the regolith particles will be, um, you know, very instructive uh, going forward. Our, our cameras will have fields of view that have lander surfaces in them uh, so that we can see over time um, if the dust moves around and how it clings to different surfaces. Um, and we hope to make measurements like this on future landers so that we can start to build up uh, more knowledge of the, the dust uh, behavior. Thanks. Yeah, this is Chris Colbert. I'll, I'll add a little bit to that one for Michelle. So this mission in particular is mostly capturing imagery, which will tell us what, how dust behaves when it's blasted during the descent and how it will move around, as Michelle just described. Um, on some future missions, we'll have some more advanced experiments which actually take a look at how dust interacts with materials and surfaces, uh, but that won't be on this first mission. Those are going to be in some future missions. And if I can just add in that there's one other uh, sensor that we have on board, and that is Rolls's has four radio antennas, and one of the modes that they have for collecting their science is to actually detect dust um, as it impacts the antenna. So, Nat, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit about that capability, but that can also help us understand the dust, how it charges up, and help us to design uh, future spacesuits as well to figure out how to minimize the dust clinging to the suits. Nat, do you have anything to add? Um, I would like to add that the uh, the dust impact uh, actually increases uh, the terminator, when, uh, so we may have have to do some operations in the night to understand more about this dust. Um, so the basic detection mechanism is that dust hitting the antenna will produce a small voltage signal. Thank you. Thank you all for responding to that question from social media. We'll now switch it back to questions from the media. First up, we have Kenneth Chang with the New York Times. Kenneth, your line is now open. Kenneth, can you hear us? All right, we'll go back. Uh, let's go over to Jeff Faust with Space News. Jeff, your line is open. Uh, good morning. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, one for Farzan. What sort of uh, landing accuracy can the navigation Doppler LiDAR provide? How does it compare, for example, to what Japan's uh, slim lander achieved last month? And then for Susan or Chris, are there any special um, 
coordination issues among the payloads to ensure that they all get the uh, power and communications that they need at the various phases of the mission. Thanks. Okay, uh, so this is Farzin. I answered the first part of your question. Um, so navigation to upper LIDAR, like I mentioned earlier, can provide very high precision velocity and altitude data, um, better, than, more than, better than the order of magnitude better than uh, radars. Now, in terms of uh, the precision landing, that really depends on the vehicle itself, how it's going to use this data to improve its precision. And uh, that really uh, depends on the, the, the landing vehicle. And I cannot really uh, comment about, for example, this IM mission is coming up. Uh, I do like to add that, uh, that uh, IM-1, the uh, Nova C vehicle, does, and this mission, does use the NDL data to help it with improving its precision landing. We are not a, a primary or critical sensor on the, on the vehicle, but uh, the data is used to help with that precision. And uh, in terms of how precise is that, uh, then it's really uh, an IM uh, question. So as far as on this, Chris, this covered, I'll, I'll add a little bit to that. We, NASA's requirements for this mission weren't very um, challenging for the very first landing on the moon. IAM has told us they believe they'll have accuracy in the 100-meter range, which is comparable to the SLIM mission from Japan. Uh, but we're not really pushing that as a, as a high priority of this mission. We'll have some future missions which will require at least 100-meter accuracy. Thank you all. Um, let's go back to Ken and oh. Sorry, Sue, do you have anything to add? Oh, th yes, that was me, Farzine, actually. Um, uh, since we are talking about future missions, um, I'd like to add that uh, with the laser LiDAR technology, it is possible to get these precisions to meters regime. Uh, you know, like I mentioned with the terrain relative navigation that is looking at the terrain features with the laser beam, getting a very good position knowledge and the navigation to offer LiDAR to navigate to that location. Uh, and uh, and the scanning uh, the train for for known feature again upon landing, we can get down to meters type uh, regime. When we did demonstrations here in the past using lidar technologies uh, uh, about a decade ago, uh, we would we got down to about 10 centimeters. Uh, so th so this type of uh, precision is quite achievable. Thank you. And just going back to the question about coordination with the payloads, this is an excellent question, and it's something that we've been working on uh, for quite some years with both our individual payload teams uh, coordinated with intuitive machines. We have six payloads on board. They have six additional commercial payloads on board as well. So in the years leading up to uh, the operations, we ensure that we have what our requests are for what our payloads need for operating uh, to intuitive machines. And then we coordinate together with timeline tools. NASA Ames has created a great playbook plan where we, and they have a, a timeline tool as well, where we put all of our plans for when each of the payloads are operating so that we can see a full coordination to ensure that the payloads don't interfere. And then as well, when payloads can run in parallel, that we maximize the amount of science return by allowing payloads that can autonomously take data, continue taking data, uh, while other payloads need to have kind of a step-by-step -step interaction with their payload to collect uh, data coming back. But this is all very well coordinated, and the plan is, has been in place for some time. And so I expect that we're going to really maximize the science return. Thank you so much, all, for responding to that question. Let's go back to see uh, Ken Chang from the New York Times. Your line is now open. Ken, can you hear us now? Yes, great. Thank you. Sorry about messing up earlier. I was wanting to ask about the landing site. It was moved to the South Polar region. And we've heard about wanting to learn about the regolith in this area, but I was wondering what other science you might be able to get from being here versus the original landing site. 
Thank you. Uh, that's an excellent question. So this particular landing site is a very old terrain. Uh, and so this terrain is, um, if you, for the geologists on board, it's more of a standard felspathic kind of highlands, and it's similar to the Apollo 16 site. So it tells us a little bit more about the original crustal materia from when the lunar magma ocean cooled, um, and of course, being beat up by impacts for billions of years, uh, covered up by the impact ejecta, can allow some of the material underneath to then surface. So all of this information can help our scientists better understand a little bit more about the, the highlands of the moon and then be able to compare it to the Apollo 16 site from the science side. Thank you. Next up, we have Leonard David with the Scientific American magazine. Leonard, your line is now open. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> for Michelle, you know, going to the South Pole, we haven't been there. Um, what kind of modeling has been done about the dust that you may or may not run into there? And the other question would be for Dan on the LRA. Uh, you know, you've got uh, SLIM has an LRA on it and the Indian uh, spacecraft. So uh, are those active? Are you doing some experiments with lasers from, uh, from LRO or, or what's the status there? Thank you. Hi, Leonard. This is Michelle. Um, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, we hope to learn uh, quite a bit uh, about this new area. In terms of modeling, um, we have, you know, the lunar source book as our source of uh, regolith data um, from Apollo. And, of course, there are some, you know, unknowns in there about, um, you know, different uh, – phenomenon, uh, different characteristics of the regolith um, in regions that we haven't actually directly measured yet. So, um, you know, compaction and um, everything comes from just scientific observations. And so there's quite a bit of uncertainty um, on different uh, parameters that we would use in a model to predict um, the amount of cratering or the amount of regolith that's you know, ejected from under a lander um, and how big the particles are and how far they would go. So those are all uh, the types of, uh, you know, uh, effects that we're trying to capture. Uh, we will not capture them all with scalps. Um, it's, near, it's merely a, you know, optical measurement of what the surface looks like after we land. On future landers, we hope to um, add more, uh, types of instruments that can build upon scalps and measure the ejecta itself, uh, as well as effects on the lander surfaces, like the lander base. Um, so those are future plans. Um, our models are pretty um, uh, immature, I'd say, <laughs> at this point, or unvalidated um, because we haven't measured uh, these phenomena directly before. Um, what we really want to do um, to understand this completely, you know, it's going to uh, vary with each location uh, somewhat and with each lander size, mass, engine configuration. Um, and so having that predictive model that can span all of those different uh, cases is going to be, you know, the key for um, really predicting what's going to happen on future flights. So in order to get that, um, we want to make these in situ measurements at the moon, like with scalps and future payloads. We also want to conduct ground testing where we can carefully control the parameters and um, investigate, you know, a wide parameter space um, to try to get a, a validated model. Thanks. And this is Daniel Kremens for LRA. Uh, thanks for the question. We are indeed continuing to range to the two LRAs currently on the surface from the Chandrayaan-3 mission and the SLIM mission. Um, as you know, the SLIM lander is, is at a non-optimal attitude for um, how we plan to use LRA, but we do still think that we'll be able to range to LRA in its current kind of um, off-nominal configuration. And the, L the orbit of LRO at the moment allows us to 
attempt to range to each LRA about once every two weeks or so. And so we will continue to do this, you know, as long as LRO and the laser altimeter on board is operational. Um, and I'd encourage you to um, next month at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, the LRA PI, Dr. Shelley's son, will be giving a presentation on the ranging results to Chandrayaan-3 and we'll also update on any results that happened essentially from January until March. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Alexandra Witz from Nature Magazine. Alexandra, your line is now open. Great. Thanks very much. My question is about ROLSES, so it's for Nat. Could you talk a little bit about the sources of interference expected? I mean, the, the Chinese had that lander on the far side where they were trying to do radio astronomy and got a lot of interference from their lander. What are you anticipating in terms of interference, both from the lander itself and then also, of course, being on the near side instead of the far side? Thank you for the question. Uh, for the uh, near side, uh, the main interference is actually, I, as I mentioned, is from the uh, terrestrial transmitters. Um, and these are um, expected and have been detected, uh, uh, you know, once or twice when the wind spacecraft was closer to the moon. And these appear as uh, horizontal lines in the, you know, daily spectra we take. And therefore, it's easy to identify um, these uh, interferences and then uh, still subtract them out uh, to get the real signal from, uh, for example, the sun. Um, so that is definitely, uh, you know, a, a very horizontal straight line, so it's easy to uh, extract. Now, uh, for the lander, this is one of the things that we do not know. We are going to characterize them. So that is, uh, that is actually completely unknown at this stage. Thanks for the question. The next one, next line we have is Jim Siegel with NASA Tech. Jim, your line is now open. Oh, thank you for taking my uh, question and good luck on this particular mission. I'm uh, curious, uh, I understand that there are about six or seven uh, other uh, uh, CLIPS missions that uh, have been planned or are on the books. And I'm wondering, are they all going to go to the same location, and are, are they going to build on each other in terms of knowledge that is one built on another? And suppose one or two of them don't make it. Is that going to uh, danger the timing on, the, on uh, Artemis III? Thank you. Okay, this is Chris Colbert. I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. So, yes, we have a number of missions. I think we're up through nine scheduled to the moon at this point. Um, they are all going to a variety of locations, mostly driven by the science that we're trying to achieve. Uh, you can't do the same science at every spot in the moon, so the objectives of the payloads tend to drive where we take them. We are having a number of missions that go to the South Pole because, of course, that's of high interest to future human exploration. Um, and there is complementary science across the missions. Um, as we learn things from one mission, we'll be able to help calibrate and prepare for future missions more effectively, so we are certainly doing some of that. Um, but none of our missions are directly linked to Artemis III or, or the planning for Artemis III. The data we gather will help agency plan better um, for all future Artemis missions. Um, but if we lose one or two, which is what this was, was intended or we knew could happen, um, it won't endanger the Artemis missions, the Artemis planning. Thank you, Chris. Our next question comes from Will Robinson Smith from Space Flight Now. Will, your line is now open. Yes, I think for taking a, uh, another question from us. Uh, follow up, if I may, uh, to Bill Harwood's question from a little bit earlier uh, to Chris Colbert. Uh, can you provide a little bit more uh, detail regarding the WDRs and how they performed, if there were any leaks that came up or any other issues? And uh, another quick follow-up, um, what are the T0 uh, liftoff options for the backup windows on the 15th and 16th? Thanks. So uh, on the wet dress rehearsals, you probably have to ask SpaceX about that. SpaceX and Tube Machine actually ran those. We, those aren't NASA functions. Um, and sorry, we missed the second part. What was your second question? So just if you have the T0 for the backup dates on the 15th and 16th. 
Um, actually, I don't have those handy. Um, we think that'll be coming out in something later on this week, but I don't have them handy with me right now. So uh, with regards to uh, launch windows and, and timings, I, we, we recommend that you reach out to the launch provider, so in this case SpaceX, uh, for responses on T-0 for the other launch opportunities. So thanks to all who submitted questions today, and thanks to our briefers for taking the time to discuss NASA's CLIPS initiative and their payloads aboard Intuitive Machines' IM-1 mission. As a reminder, SpaceX is targeting no earlier than 12.57 a.m. Eastern on Wednesday, February 14th for a Falcon 9 launch of Intuitive Machines' first lunar lander to the moon's surface. We appreciate you joining us. A recording of this briefing will be available on nasa.gov slash clips. That will wrap today's briefing. Thank you.